Okay, we're recording now. Hello there. Welcome Hello to the there. First, welcome to the first Gross Cast, where we're going to do some talking about and chatting about Otto Gross, um, who's an interesting figure from the history of psychiatry. And uh, myself and Corin are going to have a little chat about him. Yeah. So we're probably just going to explore generally who he was and what he was about. Um, just some general stuff, really, to, to start off with. So he was he was born in Germany, was he? <laughs> <laughs> good start, good start. So he was born in Syria, Austria, which is a small town of a couple of thousand people in 1877 yeah but this is pre germany is not it it's sort of it's still yes yeah, it's, it's it's pre germany it's, it's when austria still had an empire um so part of their boundaries went into po what's now poland and czech republic and places like that yeah i think that's important like germany's a lot more fractured uh, yeah than it is today it's sort of it's more of a kind of series of states, series of small states at that point. Um, well, ge like Germany, German is spoken in Austria and in, in most of the countries around there. So even Czech Republic and other places, a lot of people can speak German. And he was from quite a well-to-do family, wasn't he? Well, very much so. So... Um, you could say his dad was part of the establishment. You could even say his dad was the establishment. So very wealthy, very educated, but also part of the um, part of the system. Yeah. So his 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 dad was Hans Gross, who's considered the father of modern criminology. Yeah. So he invented um, forensic policing and the jewelry system and stuff like that yeah he's kind of like a sort of i've invented csi yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah. crime scene investigations but he yeah. i think he was a bit more interested in psychology as well from that he yeah, was, was, was interested in all of it yeah from the um, I, I, Carry on. I haven't seen sorry i haven't i haven't seen evidence of it but i suspect otto was introduced to freud through his dad well i'm not completely sure but for, for certain his dad liked freud and had read his early stuff and had an interest from the beginning yeah because it's going to feed into that work and it's that kind of criminology we're talking about it's yeah so his dad was a psychologist as well yeah, yeah it's what drives people to commit crimes and can yeah that tool of psychoanalysis and some understanding of human psychology uh, help yeah. detect things and uh, and find out causes and that kind of thing. But he was interested in types as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he was um, interested in criminal types. Um, was his father. His father, yeah. So his, his father had, there's loads of interesting things with criminology that he was involved in, but um, he was definitely a psychologist as well, and he wanted Otto to follow him as a as a psychologist, as a criminal psychologist, right? And to emulate himself. Oh, well, right, like father, like son. Like father, like son. So he wanted his son to match him, or or to even improve on him. Yeah. In that field. Join the family business. Join the family business. Make a name. Yeah, it's quite, my name on. The, it's in the air at that time, the idea of uh, kind of criminal types. Yeah. is kind of in the air. It comes sort of a little bit from Darwin and that kind of thing, a little bit from odd, uh, strange offshoots yeah. of Darwinism, like, well, eugenics. Um, eugenics, yeah. Uh, phrenology. And there's all these kind of things in the mix. We're talking sort of mid 1800s, late 1800s. Yeah. And all these kind of new, almost sciences 
creeping into the mix and people trying them out um practically um and so he's in that's the sort of background of his what his father was doing and there's i think gross was quite a sort of precocious child wasn't he i mean yeah so he because his dad was wealthy and successful and stuff um also was schooled at home for the most part so he had he was basically hot house at home so he was I like very, that. Un, nice. very unusual hot hell very, very unusual for them days very unusual for them days so very precocious yeah. um highly educated for young kids that's, that's aristocratic money oh for sure yeah yeah I mean, it's, that's why I'm talking about the establishment and being part of the system. He was up there. Yeah. And we have some quotes from his parents. We know, we have more, we don't know that much about his mother. Um, but, oh. uh, we do have, quote, more, obviously there's more stuff from Hans Gross because he was a public figure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. The, the the idea that he was precocious but also from a very early age had a kind of contrarian personality to some degree like he was yeah, a, yeah. Like a maverick child a maverick child this is what they said so I, I can't remember the exact quote but apparently Hans had a Hans um, had a guest and he said to the guest watch out for the child because he bites there you go it, yeah. and the, 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 there's some reference also to the fact that they couldn't get him to do what they wanted yeah um that he would have to arrive at the t decision himself or you know it, it, it seems to me like very kind of psychologically very simple like the dad's very authoritarian He's trying to, he's over educated and can make them really intelligent, and then the kids just say no and arguing back. Yeah, there's a, you could describe it as a natural kickback, but the way they, but the way they, and him trying to establish himself and break yeah. away under the shadow of the father and all that. Um, but he didn't, he saw in the, the early part of his life, he kind of towed the line a little bit. I mean, he he became he did go to medical medical school, didn't he? Yeah, he went to medical school. Medical school. He's a trained psychiatrist, I think. Um, and then his first job, he was a medical doctor on a boat. Yeah, and in South America. We start to see drug drugs creeping into the picture quite early on, don't we? Um, yeah, I think I think we should go back slightly. So. Okay. Um, during his childhood, one of the things that he himself said was one of the things that affected him was he he was basically kept in his parents' bedroom until he was like four or five years old. So he witnessed them having sex at a young age, and that's something that disturbed him. Yeah. Um, and obviously, as as a child, you don't understand what's going on. So he's, he saw it as an aggressive act from his dad to his mom. So yeah. part, part of his rebellion to his father was part of that as well. Um, a kind of distrust and, and wanting to protect his mother. Yeah. And when is he talking about this? Because this uh, is an aspect in great uh, psychology, you know, yeah. um, the idea that even if you don't necessarily see your parents having sex, you have some yeah. sense that's what's happening. Yeah. And it has a psychological impact on your yeah. development. Um, and often, the yeah, the father's seen as the aggressor in that yeah. um, setup. Because you st still have this very strong motherly bond at that point, you know. Um, yeah, slightly puritanical idea or stuff but i'm interested if when he said that even and whether that crept into the kind of psychological law via him or um, well, I, think, I think he mentioned it a few times um but he definitely talked with 
how long about it when he was in the hospital in, in Switzerland. Right. Um, but even prior to that and post that, he did a lot of um, work on child psychology. Um, and the, what was different, different between him and Freud and uh, Jung was also was very empathetic with the child's point of view and, and considering it from there. Yeah. Rather than as an adult looking back. Um, so even before Anna Freud also was already talking about some of her concepts with a bit of empathy and understanding, right. which the other people didn't. And a lot of that comes back from his own experience. Yeah. That he was trying to work with himself. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. And let's move, yeah, let's go to, let's try and stick to technology a little bit before we yeah. get down and Freud and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about drugs because they were a big part of his life really yeah. um and there's so, there seems to be some confusion as, as to whether he was taking drugs before he became a doctor and went to south america or whether uh he was taking drugs because he had with had an accident in South America. There seems to be different sources about that information, um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not completely sure. For I, I've certainly read numerous art, articles where he's started taking drugs when he was on the boat in South America. Um, but also, I'm not sure if that was what he was buying from the South Americans, or he was just prescribing to himself. Yeah. I'm not sure about that either. Yeah, and we have to remember the context here, because things like cocaine and um, morphine, and stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. opiates, were readily available at this time. Oh, actually, I believe one of the first jobs he started taking was arsenic, yeah. which was very popular at the time for some reason. But you could literally just go to the chemists to get these things. Yeah. Um, well, well, that is... Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in this world. Uh, I mean, it seems to be. If you look at the opiate epidemic in America, it seems to be coming round again. You know, yeah. I mean, supposedly a legitimate source of these drugs, but it doesn't seem to be doing them any good. Um, Prescribed drugs, yeah. Um, and obviously, there's always this question with Gross that he's he's taking all these drugs all the time. And is that, you know, that's obviously a reaction to something. Yeah. And it's an easy way to dismiss him and some of the things, some of his writing and some of his uh, additions to psychoanalysis. But it also points out that he, uh, he has some trauma that he's trying to mask by taking all these drugs and maybe some insight because of the trauma, not necessarily the drugs, um, that the slightly more uh, conservative, shall we say, Freud and Jung don't have, but they kind of get access to through him in some way. Um, oh, uh, Freud took drugs as well, didn't you, at one point? Yeah, I mean, it, that's, it's difficult, again, it's difficult to know how I mean, at least at least with Gross, we know he was, he was doing it a lot of the time. Was hospitalised yeah. a lot every every day for yeah. decades. Yeah, uh. but which is this is why I mentioned the widespread availability of these things. That it's difficult to know how normal that was. In yeah, the, well, it wasn't it wasn't um, illegal, and it wasn't really understood very well either. Yeah. Um, um, I, I'd have to admit to a lack of knowledge on Freud's drug taking, how serious, how often and relevant. I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not an expert on that either. I, I, I do know he took cocaine, um, but then he, he stops. So by the time there's a relationship with Jung and, and Otto, Freud wasn't using. Yeah. For sure. Um, so that 
it that is into the mix as well. That's into the mix with gross and um, you know certainly for me, I would say that um, people don't tend to take drugs unless they're trying to get away from something or mask something or or not deal with uh, some traumatic issues that they have and uh, from their childhood um, and uh, you know he's he's compromised in all sorts of ways by that um, and hamstrung by it in all sorts of ways by other people and ham to a certain extent hamstringing himself as well yeah um and but obviously it plays into this whole myth of him as a romantic kind of crazy character you know yeah. well um so uh so he even with this all this going on <laughs> He manages to uh, start working as a psychiatrist. Yeah. Um. So I believe um, quite early, so say I think around 1902, he was doing lectures in. Um, Is it Munich he's in, or? It might be Zurich. Zurich. Um, he's doing lectures on Freud's work before most people had, had heard of Freud. Right. Um, so he was already getting involved with his work and his concepts and, and kind of spreading the words and putting it out there before probably anyone else. Or, and he's or written, people. it's not like he just wrote one or two articles or anything. He's written quite a lot of, of yeah. work. Um, and you wouldn't think it because barely anybody's heard of this guy. Yeah. Um, and to some extent, you know, he's there right at the beginning. Yeah. Of the kind of legitimate modern, you, you might say the modern version of um, psychiatry. And yeah. he's right there at the source, like second generation. There's Freud and... Freud is establishing legitimacy for this new yeah. science. And he's right there in the second wave. With well, it's the it's, is it the second wave or the first wave? Well, I mean, yeah. But he's, it's, he's, he's right in at the absolute inception of this. Yeah, he's, he's there at the beginning. So, in the conscious to consciousness. So for people to not have heard who he is is yeah. a bit strange, isn't it? Um, uh, and I think that's why I think that's why we're interested, well, like partly why we're interested in in him. Um, why yeah. we want to talk about him and, and bring him forward? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what what was he saying that was so bad? You know, um, I think he had some great ideas. It was yeah. just um, way ahead of his times. Yeah. So let's so he's he does end up in practice so he is dealing with patients and he's writing uh medical papers yeah psychiatric papers yeah and and do we know when he meets jung and freud um, it's it's slightly hazy. So this is the, this is contestable information, isn't it? This is like you read a lot of history, and a lot of it is like hearsay or speculation or something that contradicts themselves. So the earliest is is factually said that he met Freud was 1906, but um, his Otto's closest friend Franz Jung. That Otto knew him way earlier than that, right? 1904, maybe even 1902. Yeah, and also um, potentially Otto and Jung met in the hospital in Switzerland earlier in 1904, when he, or maybe earlier, where, where he was sectioned 
So he managed, is... to get, he managed to get sectioned as early as 1904. Yeah. It, now, this is the this is the often a lot of the confusion because yeah. um, because he's in and out of institutions both as a doctor <laughs> yeah. and a patient. And he, 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 he must have loved institutions. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so it's and often we only get one mention here and there. So it's we're dealing with fairly scant sources. Um, which yeah. is often why we can't say for definite he met so and so at this point and he met so and so. I, I believe there's a. Um, I mean, the thing is, I haven't seen it either, but there's, there's supposed to, supposedly. How, how do you even pronounce the name of the hospital in Switzerland? The Bergholtzi. Uh, I always pronounce it the Bergholtzi. <laughs> Bergholtzi, I. But that's. Anyone who knows, that's going to be mangled. Like, uh, <laughs> me, I'm like, English. I can I can't pronounce anything. Yeah, you know. Um, we need we need some Austrian speakers. What, yeah, some Swiss, mess, mess Swiss, with, Swiss and Austrian speakers. Um, German speakers. So uh, uh, apparently he was sectioned for drug use. So now is this the time when he said he kind of said you need to section me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so he signed a piece of paper that said, um, you can section me and don't let me leave until I'm off the drugs, basically. Yeah. So he's aware that he's not in control yeah. of himself and that he needs to submit uh, the care of himself to somebody else. Yeah. Um, and that he wouldn't be able... So it's just, it, po it points to how serious his drug issues were. Um, but it points to his, uh, his awareness of that. Yeah. Also, the fact that he d couldn't take care of himself. Yeah, and he's he's accepted it. Yeah. And and said he needs help, or you know. Yeah, presumably because he's he's, he's going to escape. You know. Uh, he's not, yeah, or he could have just not have gone, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so there's some awareness there, um, uh, even in the sort of depths of his uh, drug habit, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's in that's really interesting in the context of his rebellion and also in the relationship to his father. Um, we can't say much about his mother because we don't really know. Um, I... But um, when we talk about his parents, it's kind of, we sort of see them as a united front <laughs> to some extent. Yeah, kind of the, the sense we get, um, it's mainly the dads and the mum was like a submissive, willing partner to him. And um, she was quite cold with Otto. Um, but we, we don't really know. This is just yeah, perhaps speculation. We could, perhaps we could dig into that on in later episodes. We're, yeah, yeah, we're just trying to build a vague chronology here. Of, um, so that potentially, whether it's 1990 or 1904, he met Cole Jung in a hospital in Switzerland for the first time. Yeah. And I've read speculation that he introduced him to Freud. That's at one, that time. Yeah, that's sort of one route to Freud, isn't it? One route to Freud. So, and initially, um, uh, Jung rather endorse, endorses um, Otto's work to Freud, doesn't he? Um, I, I, I think maybe the other way around. Right. Um. So. Um. Also, I had a relationship with Freud before Jung, or before Jung did with Freud. So I don't think Jung knew Freud until 1906 or later. 1907, uh, sorry, 907, 1907. Um, so Otto and Rose had a relationship before Freud and Jung did. Um, oh, did you mean Freud and... You mean Freud had a relationship with Gross? 
Yeah, with gloves. Yeah. Sorry for calling him Otto all the time. I know it's technically incorrect, but um, it's my man Otto. I, yeah. You know. Well, this is quite interesting because it begs the question: um, Did Freud was Freud aware of Gross's father? I I'd be surprised if he wasn't. Exactly, he's a big uh, public figure uh, in the same part of the world. He's in, in the same country. Yeah, he's endorsing uh, the work of Freud yeah. for, in criminology. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Freud's whole gig at this point is to try and legitimise the science. Um, yeah, and al and also to make connections not within. Whole, not the whole. Not the whole thing. I've well, understated that. I mean, we could argue about that, but he he was definitely trying to find people within the system to help legitimise his work. Sure. Um. So so having Hans Gross having some sort of connection would definitely help. Yeah. It legitimise him as a person and his work. Yeah. But there'd definitely be a part of that going on as well. Yeah, and uh, obviously the by extension by extension does does Freud look kindly on uh, yeah. Gross's son? Yeah. Otto. Yeah. Um, for the same reasons. Um, yeah, quite possibly. You know, regardless of the work. But I think they were so f interested in the work, it has to be that they were interested in the work as well, you know. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to know. So a lot of, a lot of stuff's quite sketchy. Um, it was, there's an interesting bit in the Dangerous Method film which is a throwaway quote which most people miss, when um, Otto gets, after he, he leaves the hospital and jumps over the wall, before he turns to Young and says, you're now the chosen one, you're, I choose you as my successor. Yeah. So in, in real life, what happened is he did write that in a letter. So I don't think he said it to me in person. I think it was a letter. But that kind of indicates that Otto was, Kind of on a level with young uh, in Freud's thoughts and affections. Yeah, it's really familial, isn't it? It's uh, almost like two competing brothers for the legacy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, and for a while, it seems like uh, Gross has potential, and even they're all talk. Everybody's talking about this. Well, not everybody, but. They're both, both Freud and Jung are talking about his potential. His potential, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, but it's, but there's also this idea that it's the potential suitor to carry the torch of uh, psychoanalysis forward. Yeah. In, in some way. And, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's also interesting that it's like, why, why not two successes? Why one successor? You know, I mean, that's quite interesting. Um, but, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, let's just talk a little bit cause we keep saying this, but, uh, yeah. it needs sort of stating we're not yeah. experts on this stuff by any means. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, we're not psychoanalysts. No, uh, we're, we're not academics. As if that wasn't clear from the outset. <laughs> we're not academic. We're just yeah. really interested in this subject. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so we not only will we keep making mistakes, um, we're sure to make mistakes, and people can correct us, engage with us if they if they want to, um, yeah. but also be aware. That the information on Otto is pretty scant. Yeah. In terms yeah. of sources. I mean, some people have done some fantastic work. Yeah. Um, collecting and collating what what there actually is. And it helps us out enormously. Um, we should mention uh, Gottfried Hewer. Gottfried Hewer, yeah. Um, the... 
who, basically the world expert. Yeah. Right. And he spent an extraordinary amount of time on uh, finding every little uh, bit that he can about uh, about gross. So we're indebted. Yeah. We're absolutely indebted to him. Um, yeah, we were, we wouldn't know too much without him. So basically, um, especially in English, there'd be next to nothing if it wasn't for Gottfried and his work. Yeah, there are other people who've also done a lot of work on growth. Yeah. 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 Um, right. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit. I mean, we could do a whole series of programs on just this, but let's talk a little bit about a scona and what what mm. is scona. Talk about a scona. Do I have do I have the quote from Paul Young? So I'm gonna find this quote. If you give me a second. I have to find it on my Instagram. Um. So Carl Jung has conflicting quotes about Otto and some stuff that is, is wrong in terms of dates and stuff. Yeah. Um, which I find interesting. But there's, there's a great quote maybe 20 years after Rose died from Jung and he says about Otto at Anascona he mostly frequented artists, literatures, political fanatic, fanatics, degenerates of all descriptions, and in the swamps of Ascona, carried on miserable and disgusting orgies. Yeah, that's quite damning, isn't it? From I, I've not heard that one before. It's a great uh, quote. It's yeah. A great quote. So let's talk loosely about what kind of a place this was i mean it was a very i mean swamps there i i <laughs> i mean i, I don't think there's any swamps it's it's, it's a very, me metaphor of it. yeah it's a very idyllic setting ascona it's on a yeah. it's near zurich isn't it um it's it, i think it's in between switzerland and italy it's on all on, the, uh, yeah, on the lake it's in the middle of all these borders yeah, loads of borders, yeah. mountains, beautiful lake. And I think a scone, whether the word Ascona means mountain of truth or whether that was just... Oh, a, no. That's, Ascona's the name of the area. The yeah. And then um, you've got Mount Verita. Yes. Yeah. Forgive me if, if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Yeah. But, uh, Verita, Veritas, truth. Verita, something like that. Yeah. And there was a kind of aristocratic pile of uh, house on top of yeah. this place. And it was essentially like a hippie commune, really, wasn't it? A hippie commune for very successful people, I'd yeah. say. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, I think to start off with, was there like um, writers, authors? Um, you had Larbin. Rudolf Larbin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the list of people, I mean, we can mention a few, a handful of the people. I mean, Jung, we know Jung went there. We know Jung went. We know um, D.H. Lawrence was there. Hans Kafka was there. Kafka, Rudolf Larbin. Um, there's a whole, uh, Hermann Hesse. Um, there's a whole gang of people who went. A lot of people from the um, Dada, Dada, Dada. Dada, you've got. Dada movement. Yeah. You've got a, a kind of, I suppose, countercultural intellectual elite. Yeah. In attendance there. And yeah. they're all in their own different disciplines. They're all engaged in with this kind of, um, they're kind of dissatisfied with modern life. Well, it needs to put, be put into 
concepts, they're not just, it's not just about modern life. The, the world at the time is very authoritarian. Yeah. Um, you really didn't have much freedom. You worked, you got married, you have children, you did what you were told. There's wars. But not for them. <laughs> Clearly not for them. <laughs> well, no, well, this is why they were there. This yeah. is why they were there. So they were like, fuck that. Yeah. So they went to this this mountain and a lot of it, so it was a vegetarian population. Yeah, um, it's not clear whether they all had to be vegetarian. They, they did within the grounds. Right. They did within the grounds. Um, but there's evidence that a few people snuck off into the town. I can't. Stuff like they're that. all reactionaries. I can't. I could can't see them. Like if there's a meat person there, they're not going to obey what all the vegans are doing. <laughs> meat person. No, I don't. I don't think so. No. I think they went into town and bought their cheese and meat and yeah. came back and. They're going to. I mean, it. imagine the cheese. In the Swiss mountains, yeah. And the uh, salami. Around there. <laughs> well, I think also another massive part of the um, Ascona community was feminism. There's feminism, uh, there's kind of occultism. Yeah. There's, this is a mixture of some of the ideas that they're exploring there. Yeah. Um, veganism, kind of back to the land sort of Back natural, to the land. Nat mother nature yeah mother nature naturalism and nudism as well so, yeah so so then I, th I think the psychologists were drawn to it after a short while um because it's kind of reverting to mother nature and they were kind of interested in psychological aspects yeah reverting to nature and being kind of honest with themselves. Yeah. It's a place of experimentation. And, yeah. and it's, it's not alone at that point in history. There were other similar centers around Europe, but there's something special about Ascona because um, it's kind of not in a city and it, they're, they're on the top of this mountain in the middle of nowhere and they've got a nice yeah. uh, country house to play around in. They can do all the dressing up that they want. I mean, some of the clothes... Dressing I mean, down. I mean, in a... <laughs> yeah, you can dress down or dress up. <laughs> You've got some of the clothes they wear. I mean, we'll cover this in a later uh, programme. But if you look at them... It looks like a rock band from the 70s. And this is turn of the century, turn of the 1800s into the 1900s. It's pretty out, it's pretty out there for the time. So yeah. like, they've got long hair. They've got crazy uh, Baroque clothes on. and I, I, I think part of it is because of who the people are. So if they were just your average person, then it's, it's just like... It's, bunch of people taking drugs and taking their clothes off yeah it, it doesn't quite have the same thing but because these are people that were established either before or afterwards um, then it, it gives it a bit, a bit more significance and interest but it's important to say they are an elite you know? they are an elite yeah, yeah. exactly um, yeah. and i think i mean we don't have very also we're talking about sources everyone we have very few photos actually of Otto Gross, don't we? Um, oh, so few. It, it's, it's painful. I think there's one which is supposed to be taken at Ascona where we have Gross standing next to Jung at Ascona. Um, but I don't, I don't know if we can confirm sure. that. I'm not sure where that located. I'll have to check. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I uh, feel like I might have just made that association. But, um, you might have just made it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, interestingly, that photo is from 1915. Is it? Yeah. Well, we, we should also say that this was like a, there were people going there all the time. Yeah. It wasn't like, it was like a kind of festival season and everyone piled down there. Yeah, 
So there's some years when certain people are there and then there's some years, and we don't really know how much, how often Gross was there and who was there when he was there. We just have a sort of vague guest list. Well, uh, it's interesting. I've seen um, reference to him being there quite early, like early 19s, like 1904, something like that. Yeah. And he, he basically went between Vienna, Ascona, Berlin and Munich. Where there were other kind of versions of these. these. Yeah, and he, he was kind of spreading the word. So he was um, spreading the word of Freud in Munich and then he was going back up to Ascona. And they also... Feeding into each other. The kind of urban versions um, tap into this idea of kind of cafe analysis, don't they? Yeah, so that's 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 one of the things that um, Otto Gross ended up basically doing. He was just doing analysis in coffee shops and it's in uh, 10, 12 hours, giving him therapy for free. Yeah. And people buying him coffee or whatever. Yeah. And he's just been sat there chatting to them. Yeah, and he's, it's part of his whole thing to kind of break the structures of the. And sit the a, a analytical situation as it was being formulated, so yeah. um, so to break the conventions of a of a session of it's just a, it's a slightly different method, isn't it? So um, I think Jung did he had a chair facing away from the therapist, so you could be a bit more open about having to look at them. Yeah, um, so it's kind of on the same sort of thing. If you're in a friendly setting, just chatting, so you're gonna be a bit more open yeah. in a coffee shop. Yeah, and talking of sort of breaking the conventions, uh, I don't know if it was actually uh, called this at the time, but the modern term would be uh, transference between the, the, the a kind of overstepping of the relationship between uh, therapist and patient. And <laughs> Um, that in modern terms it would some, be something that you try and guard against or be aware of in analysis uh, to avoid too much sort of imprinting colour from either party colouring the analysis um, or be aware of it because it might unlock something but yeah. um, uh Gross was adamantly against <laughs> against this convention, wasn't he? He was, or, or what they were trying to build there, they were trying to build some, this idea of sort of doctor and patient. Gross would be, just chuck that out of the window, you know. Yeah, so I think like the basic theory is if you're the doctor, you carry your own issues, your own subconscious and your own preconceived ideas. So when you're chatting to the patient, you're you're transferring yourself into the conversation, and also there's a, there's a line of authority as well. Yeah, the we dynamic. can we can go in, in a later episode. We can go in. Sure, we'll go into that. We can go deeper into transference because it's quite it's quite a complex idea to get across. Um, yeah, but um, but. He, he he was a maverick in this as well. He's he? a maverick. He's a maverick in everything, basically. Yeah. So uh, he didn't like this. So he was going. I mean, even to the point of, uh, and we sort of come on to the uh, case of Spielrein. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, just, just before that. So okay. We let, uh, we, <laughs> just just very briefly, very briefly. So part, part of this rebellion, like you can just say like all of it comes back to his dad. So you've got this authority figure who is a police system. And yeah. he's just saying no, and he's rebelling, constantly yeah. saying no. I doesn't think, like authority, doesn't like rules. Yeah, it's, it's very significant. Not only is his father a kind of authoritarian figure in familial terms, 
but yeah. in societal terms as well. Yeah. So. Um, uh, and then, and between them, um, the battling psychological concepts, there's that's got very strict authoritarian ideas of. Yeah. And structure. And Otto's fighting him and rebelling. And he's like, no, let's all be free and. Yeah. You know, do what we want. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's lots of ways to read that. And we'll go into that later. Um, but, okay. but that's the. That's the battleground, if you like. That's the battleground. Yeah. Um, so where we were going, we were talking a little bit about us going, and then we were, well, uh, I and we were talking a little bit about cafe analysis. Um, oh, we should also mention that there was. There oh, spillways. Spill well, there you were. Know. Oh well, yeah. I mean. I don't think he ever came out. He might have said this, but um, you know, uh, Gross was a bit of a fuck you, fuck the patients kind of a guy. <laughs> you know, he wasn't uh, like he'd take that trying to preserve the uh, the patient uh, therapist thing and really throw it out of the way. Don't, don't refresh yourself, man. Yeah. If you, if you want to do it, you do it. Yeah. So any sort of a pre a repression for gross is oppression. So yeah. um, it's like, no, you've got these instincts. Just go with them regardless, you know. Um, and oh. those of you who have seen the, the, the film A Dangerous Method, the David Cronenberg film, um well we could i don't know if we should do spoilers really <laughs> i think it's good for people to go and what re -watch, watch that film or re -watch, re watch it um but uh yeah that sort of op certainly that idea of not repressing your basic drives uh did have influence on those around him not only in his own life, but even on Jung. Yeah, so when he was in the hospital, and they, they had a mutual analysis when basically Otto is about to be sectioned, or he was sectioned more or less, um, they were talking about this sort of stuff. And Jung had some sort of feelings for his patient, Sabina. And Otto was just like, if, if you want to do stuff with her, just do it. And he got into his mind, you know, he got into his mind. So why are you talking about repression? You're, you're repressing yourself. Yeah, certainly Jung mentioned that when he would have sessions uh, with Gross, that they'd keep flipping roles. Yeah. And there was, and Gross had this idea of uh, mutual analysis. Um, yeah, so this comes, that comes back to the transparency thing as well, partly. Yeah. So rather than doctor patient, this sort of mutual analysis idea, um, yeah. which again, you know, you know, if an idea is worth having, it's also worth criticizing, you know. So, um, and that did have impact later on, on the history of psychoanalysis. You know, this is not a yeah. small thing. Um, so, yeah, and it, this was a, a bit like this kind of, co I want to say coffee analysis, uh, cafe analysis <laughs> um, situation that he was in, you know. Analysis. Yeah, it's sit around for hours, you know, in Vienna on a table next to Hitler, drinking tons, <laughs> drinking tons of cups of coffee, getting really into it, you know. I, I, can, I can kind of imagine it like Young sat there trying to analyze him and be a professional, and Gross is just going, But let's, let's, what about you, man? Let's talk about you. Yeah. Now, what's going on with you? You tell me your issues and yeah. 
But it's what's, what, what's funny about it as well is it's the classic thing, like the comedy thing, which actually happens, you know, where you'll see it in a comedy or film or something where someone will go to the um, asylum or the institution and then they'll be greeted by a doctor and then they'll realise somewhere down the line or someone will come and tell them that that's one of the patients. So they'll be presenting as a doctor, you know, and it's kind of, um, it's kind of funny, you know, um, that trope is that it exists. I don't know if it existed at the time, you know, but, um, yeah, I, I, I think it might be like a suggestion that because he was a bit nuts, he would have, and because he was a doctor and a psychiatrist, it would give him greater insight into the field that Boyd and Young can reach because he was doctor and a patient, basically. Yeah. And to a certain extent, he's just trying to destroy himself at the same time, you know. I mean, it's, it's, he's got quite a self destructive impulse in him. Um, yeah, so it's 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 kind of it's unusual in that like you're so saying that sort of behaviour with musicians and artists and stuff, but not for high level professionals, where really you need to be behaving yourself a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, but um, it's also important that there's, you know, he's important in in terms of. There need to be critics of of the canon of psychoanalysis for the yeah. thing to grow, for the thing to progress in any way. So, and in some senses, he represents kind of one of the first critics from within the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, he's he's in the inside. the very temple. You know, he's right. At the that, I, th I, th I think that's a whole episode we could go into about yeah. that. So there's a lot of issues with uh, Freud and his non-evidence work in the early days, particularly, and yeah, people people disagreeing with him and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about Ascona, uh, but we should. All, that's what I was going to say. There were there was a a lot of kind of proto political movements happening at Ascona and at these other kind of commune sites, and it's a function of the time, yeah. um, because they're in this sort of fin de siècle shift of the century. Let's have new beginnings. Oh, the old ways are not it's, right. It's it's an absolutely incredible period yeah. of time. Yeah, and we can see echoes of similar things happening, you know, in our time and uh, yeah, in the 20th century yeah. as well. Um, yeah. So they're all getting together to try and change the world, you know, in some yeah. way. And so there's a lot of kind of... Uh, anarchist communist types there um and it's important to say that gross was big into this and especially amongst his peer group his friends so people like musham yeah, um, um was a big he was a big mate of his and they were all involved in these kind of anarchist or proto-anarchistic political movements. And that, there's a point where he seems to kind of, he's either trying to take his anarchistic views and put them into psychoanalysis, into his psychoanalytical work, or, or even later, he's kind of drifting away from psychoanalysis altogether and yeah. just writing these frenetic um, sort of, manifestos if yeah you know. yeah but this is partly why 
there's a number of reasons why Freud cut him out of the inner circle. But anarchy is definitely one of them. So Freud's trying to establish psychoanalysis and, and a system. And then you've got a guy trying to go somewhere you've got else. a guy whose mates want to blow things up. Say that again, sorry? You've got a guy who's mate, he's hanging out with a bunch of people who want to blow things up. Yeah. 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 It's like, um, I think one of the reasons Otto is not respected even now by some people is he, he moved into politics and anarchism and stuff like that. He didn't yeah. just remain a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And he kind of blurred the line way too much for a lot of people. Yeah, you can read that. You can read it creeping into his writing. And and he's, he's even he's openly explicit about it. And he'll quote. So rather than quoting medical sources, or um, other analysts writing. He quotes oh. political thinkers and, and, and says, oh, we should put this into what we're doing. You know, he I think, I, think one the, I think one of the earliest kind of differences between him and Freud and Jung was, he, I think he was even the first person that talking about the subconscious and society. Whereas Freud was talking about childhood and the subconscious and, and the personal experience in the subconscious. Otto, Otto Gross was talking about society in the unconscious and how we, we react and do stuff on a subconscious level due, due to the reactions of society and expectations I, and, and I, history I as well. I think, sorry to say, but I think you're wrong yeah. about that. Oh, um, okay. So I think both Freud and Jung did write about society and um and but what i would say with gross is um there's well this is we could get into this in a in a longer episode okay. i seem to just keep saying this um but this is the okay. this is the intro episode um but they all to uh, almost all analysts to a degree, the kind of function of an, one of the functions of analysis is to um, to kind of socialize the patient for society so they can yeah. get on in society. Yeah. Yeah. So they all come up against this, against politics and uh, the ills, the wider ills of society and. Yeah whether the individual, how the individual intersects at some point. So yeah. it's always a question. They just have different answers <laughs> to that. Yeah, they, have different, they have different answers. Yeah. So Freud and Jung were trying to help people deal with life the way it is. And, um, yeah. And there's a very relevant question is, and what if the, what if the society is sick? Yeah. Then, what is the point of a, you know, making someone ready to fit into that sick society? Um, well, I think that's what Otto's argument was, wasn't it? So, and somehow become more sick. Yeah. Um, or just, or just living with it the way it is and accepting. Yeah. A repressed society. Yeah. Any of any of the above. So it is an issue, and yeah. obviously it comes up all the time. Um, but uh, it's, I think Gross certainly believed in um, actively changing the world. Um, yeah, well, this, this comes back again to him being a kind of a romantic figure and a maverick. Um, it's all very, um, like, his heart on his sleeve. Yeah. Wanting to change the world, wanting to help people. It's all very kind of naive in a way. It is childlike, and it it, childlike. It, but it also possesses that kind of youthful energy and hubris. Yeah. And that 
and if you put him next to the other two, you know, Young seems like, I don't know if they were, but Young seems like a much older man. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I seem like a very similar age, but... Yeah. Yeah, if you put them side by side, you'd, you'd think Young was a lot yeah. older, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's more of a sage character, and yeah. uh, Gross is more of a like angry teenager. Yeah. Um, Very childlike. Yeah. 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 So... Do you want to end it uh, going towards the sort of disaster? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the sort of doom and gloom bit, or you know, or should we should we um, talk about something else? Go off on a tangent because we've kind of covered the um, we've covered the, some basics. I mean, the, some of the history there. Well, yeah. one of the reasons he's so interesting is we could literally talk for five hours about loads yeah. of different aspects i mean and there's some we haven't even touched on yet so and i think that's why i'm interested in doing these chats because it, even though and we should say this about it because because there there aren't many sources of information about him it's tempting to fill in those gaps yeah all the time or yeah. write your own history from your perspective and use use the gaps in what's known about gross to kind of retell history and everybody's kind of a little bit guilty of that and we certainly speculate from our own biases um our, our we're, own transferences yeah while we're doing this yeah. um but uh it, it, he's but he's also useful as a kind of pivot point to talk about generally about um the ideas from Ascona and their impact on the world and the idea, his own impact on psychoanalysis and uh, and just psychoanalysis generally. So he, he, he's had a big impact on literature and the art world. Yeah. Which, which will come to further down the line. Yeah. And even just from a perspective of it, he had an interesting and uh, turbulent life, you know. Well, that, th this is definitely one of the things. That's why he's so interesting. Yeah. Is he? He wasn't just sat there talking and saying interesting things. He was saying interesting things, and he was living the life he was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what makes him stand out, especially if you consider a hundred years ago, hundred and ten years ago. Yeah. And it also says something about the history of the time, which is also fascinating because yeah. um, there's many attempts to, I mean, we talk about the Ascona as a period of experimentation, uh, but it is a nexus point of all these kind of radi radical ideas. Um, and it's interesting what comes after, do any of those come to fruition? How do they change? Uh, you know that's that sort of thing um they're all very idealistic um and okay so yo <laughs> what are we gonna do next episode what's that what's our next um... that's a good question yeah i don't really what know should we talk about? i don't know <laughs> i don't really know um it's, it's so difficult because there's so many ideas and then if we get bogged down in too much detail. Yeah, I think we'll just, um, I mean, I'd like to just pose a question, you know, yeah. go off on that and okay. then see where we go with it. So, yeah, and there's lots of, lots of things we could start with. I'd rather not say right now, <laughs> I'm on a, I'd rather not I'll say spend some time and pick, pick one that seems quite cool. juicy. All right, so we're gonna do, we're gonna yeah. do another video class soon. We are. Um, Gross Bo also had influence on the arts, as I said, um, in Berlin, Munich, psychiatry, um, literature and stuff like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that, a bit more about Ascona, Anarchy, and his relationship with Freud and Jung going forward. Um, and, and we'll see where, where we get. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you if you've watched this. 
uh, tune in for the next one. And uh, we'll see you next time. And if you have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in this topic and uh, maybe you know a lot more about it than we do, it would be yeah. very good to talk to you. Um, so, because we're going to pursue this and maybe even make a documentary after we've uh, finished uh, having all these chats. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll appreciate your insights and feedback as well. Absolutely. All right. All right, folks. Bye for now. Catch you later. Bye.